Hello everyone and welcome to my channel. Today we're going to discuss a very important topic, methods and tools of data collection. Let's begin by understanding what we mean by methods of data collection. Simply put, a method refers to the specific way or steps we use to collect data during a research process. It outlines how we go about gathering the information we need. Now, what about tools of data collection? To make this clear, let me give you a simple example. Suppose you want to cut vegetables, you would use a knife. Similarly, a nurse who wants to check a patient's body temperature would use a thermometer. In these examples, the knife and the thermometer are tools, instruments used to perform a specific task. In research, tools serve the same purpose. They are devices or instruments used to collect, measure, and analyze data. A tool helps you not only to gather information, but also to measure and interpret that information accurately. So, in essence, a tool in research is any device that aids in the collection and evaluation of data. Let's now take a closer look at the methods of data collection, starting with one of the most common, the interview. An interview is essentially a communication process between two people. One person asks questions and the other responds. The individual who asks the questions is called the interviewer, while the person responding is the interviewee. So, an interview is a form of conversation with a purpose, to gather information. Interviews can be categorized into two main types, structured and unstructured. A structured interview follows a predetermined format. This means the interviewer prepares a fixed set of questions, for example 10 or 20 questions, and sticks strictly to them. There is no deviation from the set list. The same questions are asked in the same order for every interviewee. Eyes in contrast, an unstructured interview is more flexible. It doesn't follow a rigid format. The interviewer may ask open-ended questions and follow up based on the interviewee's responses. This type of interview is more conversational and allows for deeper exploration of the topic. As you read various textbooks or references, you may come across different definitions or perspectives on methods and tools. However, the core ideas remain the same. In this session, I've aimed to give you a simple and clear explanation of both concepts. Stay tuned as we explore more methods and tools of data collection in detail. In an unstructured interview, the questions are not predetermined. You have the flexibility to adapt the questions based on the intelligence level and responses of the interviewee. For example, if you ask someone, what is your view on the environmental movement, and they give either a supporting or opposing answer, you can follow up with a question like, why do you feel that way? In this format, you tailor your questions according to the respondent's understanding and depth of thought. This adaptability is what distinguishes an unstructured interview from a structured one. Since there's no fixed set of questions in advance, the conversation can flow more naturally and dig deeper into the subject matter. Now, let's talk about the tool used for conducting interviews. The tool here is called an interview schedule. An interview schedule is a guide that outlines what to ask, when to ask, and how to ask specific questions. While the method is the interview itself, the tool that facilitates the process is the interview schedule. Moving on to the next method, questioning. This is something most of you are already familiar with, especially through written exams. In this context, the tool used is a questionnaire. A questionnaire consists of a series of questions prepared by the researcher, which the respondent is required to complete. There are two main types of questions within a questionnaire. Open format and closed format questions. An open format question allows the respondent to answer freely and in detail. For example, if a restaurant asks, what was your experience in our establishment? You can describe your experience in your own words, talking about the food, the ambiance, the behavior of the staff, and so on. You might respond in 50 or even 100 words, much like writing a short paragraph or essay. This type of question encourages personal expression and detailed feedback. In the other hand, a closed format question provides limited response options. For instance, do you like ice cream? is a closed question. The respondent can only answer with a simple yes or no. 
These types of questions are more structured and easier to quantify, but offer less insight into the respondent's thoughts or feelings. So, in summary, when it comes to questioning as a data collection method, the tool is the questionnaire, and it can include both open and closed format questions, depending on the goal of the research. Let's move on to the next important method of data collection, observation. So, what is observation? In the context of research, observation refers to the process where the researcher carefully watches and studies the subject or a particular activity or behavior in order to collect data. This method allows the researcher to gather first-hand information directly from the field. Observation is classified into several types. Struction observation, unstructured observation, non-participant observation, Let's take a closer look at each of these. Structured observation. Structured observation is a planned and systematic method. The researcher decides in advance what to observe, when to observe, and how to observe. Everything is organized and predetermined, just like in a structured interview. This type of observation ensures consistency and objectivity as the researcher follows a specific format or guideline throughout the process. In contrast, unstructured observation does not follow any fixed plan. The researcher does not decide in advance what to observe or how to go about it. Instead, observations are made spontaneously and flexibly based on what the researcher finds relevant at the moment. This type allows for more natural and in-depth insight but may lack uniformity. 3. Participant observation Participant observation means the researcher actively takes part in the event or activity being observed. For example, if a researcher wants to study the dynamics of a football game, they might join the team and play alongside the players. While being a participant, the researcher simultaneously observes and collects data about the event. This approach helps in gaining deeper insider perspectives. 4. Non-participant observation In non-participant observation, the researcher does not take part in the activity, but remains an external observer. Using the football example again, the researcher would watch the game from the stands or sidelines without getting involved in the activity. Although the researcher is physically present, they are not participating in the event itself. This method helps in maintaining objectivity and avoiding influence on the observed behavior. Tools used for observation. Just like other methods, observation also requires specific tools to help the researcher gather and record information effectively. Two common tools used in observation are 1. Rating scale. The rating scale is a tool used to evaluate or express an opinion about the performance of a person, object, or situation. It is widely used today. For example, when you buy a product online from Amazon or Flipkart, you are often asked to rate your experience or the quality of the product. Definition A rating scale is a tool that allows the observer to express an opinion or judgment about the performance or quality of a subject in a structured format. Example Let's say you're asked to evaluate the performance of nurses in an ICU. The options on the rating scale might include vibreactive, active, messagingable, unsatisfied, uninformed, rassive. You simply select the option that best reflects your observation. Other rating scales might use categories like Kari good, class good, and gag poor. This tool is especially useful in summarizing qualitative observations into measurable data. 2. Checklist. A checklist is another commonly used observation tool. As the name suggests, it involves a prepared list of specific items or actions that need to be checked for their presence or absence. Example 1. A food inspector visiting a restaurant might use a checklist to evaluate factors such as purity of water, requality of food, bekazavir of staff, ofisticability of electricity, proper ventilation, and drainage system. For each item, the inspector checks yes or no, depending on whether the condition is met. This structured approach helps in making consistent and systematic evaluations. Example 2. An examiner evaluating a nursing student during a blood pressure procedure might use a checklist to assess whether certain steps were followed. Was handwashing performed? Was the procedure explained to the patient? Were the necessary articles arranged? Was documentation completed?
Based on this checklist, the examiner can reach a conclusion about the student's performance. In summary, a checklist is a pre-prepared list of items that helps the observer verify whether specific actions or elements are present or not during an activity. Together, the rating scale and the checklist are valuable tools in making the observation method both reliable and efficient, allowing researchers to systematically collect and interpret data. We've already explored interviews, questionnaires, and direct observation. Let's look at three more approaches. 1. CCTV observation Closed-circuit television, CCTV observation, uses video cameras to record behavior or events without the researcher's physical presence. It's ubiquitous today. Shop security, traffic monitoring, even wildlife studies use CCTV. Because it requires no further explanation, I'll simply note that CCTV provides a permanent record that can be reviewed, paused, and analyzed later. 2. Biophysiological Methods Biophysiological methods involve measuring the body's biological and physiological processes to collect data. These techniques tell us what's happening inside a living organism. Its heart rate, blood chemistry, body temperature, and so on. In vivo measurement. In vivo literally means within the living. Here, both the procedure and the measurement occur directly on or inside the subject's body. Classic examples include Butterlud pressure monitoring using a sphygmomanometer on the arm. Body temperature checks using a clinical thermometer. Because the measurement is taken at the site of interest, inside or on the body, results are immediate. In vitro measurement. In vitro means in glass. The procedure involves removing a sample from the body and measuring it in a laboratory setting. Common examples. Blood tests, where a sample is drawn, sent to the lab, and analyzed for glucose, cholesterol, or other biomarkers. Or analysis, where urine is collected, processed, and examined under controlled conditions. In vitro methods allow for a wide range of chemical, molecular, and cellular analyses that can't be done in vivo. 3. Projective techniques. Other methods. Projective techniques are creative, open-ended tasks designed to reveal a person's attitudes, motivations, or emotions. Rather than asking directly, how do you feel? Researchers give participants ambiguous stimuli because these tasks tap into subconscious associations, projective techniques can uncover deeper insights than direct questions alone. That wraps up our survey of data collection methods and their associated tools. I hope this overview helps clarify when and how to use each approach. Thanks for watching, and I look forward to exploring more research techniques with you soon.